Chapter One of England and the Hundred Years' War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. England and the Hundred Years' War by Charles William Chadwick Oman. Chapter One From the Accession of Edward the Third to the Fall of Mortimer, 1327 to 1331. On the 7th of January, 1327, the Parliament of England, duly assembled at Westminster, declared that their king, Edward of Carnarvon, was deposed and that they had chosen in his stead his eldest son, Edward, Prince of Wales, to fill the vacant throne. In all the long annals of the nation, no reign has ever commenced under such shameful auspices as the fifty years' rule of King Edward III. His miserable, shiftless father had been deposed not so much by the will of the nation as by the private enmity of an unfaithful wife and a faction of disloyal barons. He had perhaps deserved to lose his crown, but not by such means, nor by the hands of such enemies. Moreover, heavy as is the guilt which rests on the conspirators who dethroned him, the nation must take its share in the blame. The mass of the baronage and the people stood aside, while Queen Isabella and her adherents worked their wicked will on the king and his friends, and hardly a voice was raised to protest against the violence and cruelty which accompanied the revolution. The mob of London made itself the accomplice of the traitors by tearing to pieces Bishop Stapleton of Exeter, one of the late monarch's few faithful followers. No complaint was made in Parliament concerning his murder, nor concerning the equally illegal execution of the Earl of Arundel and the two dispensers, whom the Queen had slain without due process of law. No one protested, save four courageous prelates, when the wretched time-serving Archbishop Reynolds cried aloud that the voice of the people was the voice of God, and pretending to take the cries of a noisy faction for the fiat of heaven, saluted the young Edward of Windsor as his king. So with surroundings of the basest cruelty, hypocrisy, and cowardice, the new reign began. Of those whose names appear in the shameful business of the fall of Edward the Second, the young boy in whose behalf the transaction was nominally carried out must bear the least blame. The new king was only fourteen years and two months old at his accession, having been born on November 13th, 1312. He had been neglected by his father and had been of late in his mother's hands. There is no reason to believe that he suspected the cause which lay at the bottom of her actions, the hatred which she felt for her husband, since she had become infatuated with the handsome, unscrupulous exile, Roger of Mortimer. In after years, we know that he felt bitter shame for the way in which he had been made the tool of his mother and her paramour. Meanwhile, he accepted the situation and freely set his hand to all the documents and deeds which they laid before him. He seems to have shown no anxiety about the fate of his father when the dethroned king was removed from Kenilworth to Berkeley Castle and put under jailers who were bent on compassing his death. Of the sinister purpose of the transference he had no suspicion. To guide the steps of the young king, the Parliament in January 1327 appointed a council of regency of four earls, four bishops, and six barons. But from the first, the real power lay in the hands of Queen Isabella, whose word was all-powerful with her son. Behind Isabella, unseen at first but growing more and more evident as the months rolled on, was the will and influence of her favorite Mortimer. They kept the young Edward in their hands, secluded him as much as possible from intercourse with those who were not of their own faction, and endeavored to the best of their ability to distract him from affairs of state. It was long before the baronage and the nation realized the true condition of affairs, and longer still before the king awoke to a consciousness of the shameful tutelage in which he was living. 
at first public affairs were conducted with some decent semblance of constitutional government the old charters of the realm were confirmed lavish promises of good government were made to parliament and persons who had been attainted in the reign of edward the second were restored to their honours and estates mortimer's power was not yet openly shown and moreover a new danger soon arose to distract the nation's attention less than three months after the young king's accession the scots broke the truce which had been concluded with them in the year thirteen twenty three and came flooding over the border into northumberland and durham savagely wasting the whole countryside as far as the weir and the tees king robert bruce was no longer at their head he was already stricken down by the leprosy of which he afterwards died but two of his old companions in arms sir james douglas and randolph earl of murray were leading the raiders twenty thousand moss troopers mounted on light galloway nags and showed themselves quite capable of carrying out their master's usual tactics to repel this invasion the young king himself took the field mortimer accompanied him for he never let edward stir far from his side the whole feudal host and shire levies of england followed them but no good fortune attended their march the scots were found waiting behind the tyne in a post too strong to be attacked in front when the english by a tolsome march turned their flank the agile enemy was found to have already decamped and to have fallen back on a second position as strong as the first mortimer would not risk an attempt to storm it the memory of bannockburn was still fresh in english memories and again when he proceeded to move around to cut off the invaders from their retreat douglas avoided him by a night march and was in safety long ere his slow-moving enemy had reached the point of vantage so edward's army followed the scots for a time always arriving too late and always finding nothing but blazing villages and slaughtered cattle to show where the foe had been the only striking incident in the campaign was a night attack which douglas made with a small party on the royal camp he cut his way far among the tents and almost captured the young king whose chaplain was slain in the scuffle then he turned back and escaped unharmed when the scots were far on their way towards the tweed the english gave up pursuit and returned to newcastle utterly foiled and nearly starved by their long wanderings on the northumbrian moors such was the inglorious introduction to war of the future victor of slouse and crecy august to september thirteen twenty seven it was perhaps in consequence of this shameful failure to cope with the scots and in fear of the discontent that it might breed against the new government that the queen and mortimer resolved to murder the dethroned king the strong constitution of edward the second had resisted the harsh treatment and cruel privations to which he had been exposed in his prison at berkeley finding that he did not show any signs of dying they resolved to put an end to him their creatures were introduced into the castle at night and secretly slew him september twenty first thirteen twenty seven his death was long concealed and when it was divulged was attributed to natural causes or a broken heart another such campaign as the last which recalled the worst misadventures of the reign of the late king would have ruined the credit of the new government accordingly the queen and mortimer resolved to make peace at any price with the scots negotiations with the bruce were carried on all through the winter of thirteen twenty seven and twenty eight and since the english were resolved on coming to terms reached a successful issue by the treaty of northampton which men call the shameful peace the independence of the northern realm was fully conceded may fourth thirteen twenty eight edward was made to sign away all claims of feudal superiority of any kind over scotland so that for the first time since anglo-saxon days the king of scots could call himself without dispute a wholly independent sovereign the scottish regalia and royal treasures together with the records of the realm which edward i had brought to london were restored with them would have gone the famous stone of Scoon which still lies under the throne in westminster abbey if a mob of londoners had not fallen upon the workmen who were removing it 
the king of england also promised to give his sister joan a little girl of seven in marriage to bruce's young son david the scots on the other hand promised to restore to their estates the barons of their realm who had been exiled for adhering to the english party and to pay twenty thousand pounds in three instalments in satisfaction for all claims for damage and compensation for the harm which they had done in their many raids into england it was only when the danger from the scottish war had been staved off that mortimer began to show openly his haughty temper and his disregard of the laws he got himself created earl of march and took upon him such state as no subject of the realm had ever before dared to display a hundred and eighty men-at-arms followed him wherever he went and were used to overawe any of the barons who showed a wish to oppose him at the parliament of salisbury in the autumn of thirteen twenty eight he came with so many armed followers at his back that most of the other peers who had been bidden to attend without large retinues fled away to winchester fearing that they were about to be seized and imprisoned moreover men began to take note of his relations with the queen they were so much together and so familiar in their intercourse that the truth began to be suspected nevertheless it was to be three years before the favourite was overthrown and ere his fall he was to do much more evil among the young king's nearest relatives were his two half-uncles edmund earl of kent and thomas earl of norfolk the sons of the second marriage of edward i these two princes joined with henry earl of lancaster who had done so much to overthrow the late king in resenting mortimer's influence they felt that they and not this upstart who ruled by the queen's favour ought to have the final word in the governance of the realm kent took the lead and drew upon himself the main brunt of mortimer's anger a disgraceful plot was laid to compass his destruction he was secretly informed that his brother edward the second was still alive kept in strict confinement in corf castle such corroboration to the story was furnished by the governor of the place that kent was fully persuaded of its truth and wrote letters to his supposed brother in which he proposed to free him and replace him on the throne the documents were promptly passed on to mortimer who when they were once in his hands seized kent's person tried him for high treason and had him beheaded the moment that he was condemned the young king was induced to set his hand to the death warrant by being told that his uncle's plan included his own murder by poison only eight days elapsed between the arrest and the execution so that kent's friends had no time to attempt anything in his behalf march thirteen thirty mortimer seized upon his victim's lands which added to the plunder of the dispensers which was already in his hands made him almost the wealthiest personage in the realm kent had been well liked by the baronage and people he was a courteous kindly and liberal prince against whom no one bore any grudge hence his fate provoked bitter murmurings and awoke the nation to a sense of its disgraceful plight the guilty relations of the queen and mortimer were growing daily more evident as long impunity made them less cautious the true story of the death of edward the second was also beginning to be brooded about hence discontent grew every day more marked and mortimer's cruel plot against kent may be said to have brought about his own ruin when men began to ask each other whether the late king had been dethroned merely in order that a vicious frenchwoman and a bloodthirsty upstart might rule england at their will it was evident that the end was drawing near the blow however was not to be dealt by any popular rising but by an unexpected hand the young king himself was at last moved to action for more than three years he had let himself be led by his mother and mortimer but at last he was developing a will of his own he was now eighteen had married a wife the fair and virtuous philippa of Hainault, and had just become the father of a son edward so well known afterwards as the black prince he at last began to use his own eyes and to take counsel of others than his mother's partisans 
gradually he began to realize that he was but the tool of mortimer accordingly he prepared to make an end of this state of things in october thirteen thirty the court was staying at nottingham and the queen and mortimer lay in the castle whose gates were well guarded by their retinue but the king opened his purpose to the governor sir william eland who feared to disobey him and consented to show him a secret passage by which he could enter without rousing mortimer's followers at midnight edward accompanied by his friend william lord montacute and a few more armed men were let into the castle and made for the apartments of the favourite mortimer was surprised as he sat conferring with the bishop of lincoln and seized before he could offer resistance but a scuffle ensued swords were drawn and two knights were slain before the king's party got the upper hand the queen burst out of her chamber and threw herself at her son's knees begging him to spare her gentle mortimer but she was dragged away and the earl was cast into bonds october nineteenth thirteen thirty a month later the king called parliament together and put the earl on his trial before the peers for murdering edward the second for overawing the parliament of salisbury by armed force for usurping several royal castles and manors without legal warrant and for having applied to his own private expenses a large part of the twenty thousand pounds paid by the scots without troubling themselves to go through the form of a trial the peers voted that all the charges contained in the articles of accusation were notoriously true and that the earl marshal should take custody of roger earl of march and execute him as a traitor and enemy of the king and realm accordingly he was hung drawn and quartered at tyburn on november twenty ninth thirteen thirty his chief counsellor sir simon bereford was also condemned and put to death john maltravers and thomas gurney the underlings who had actually murdered king edward the second were not captured they were proclaimed traitors and a price set on their heads gurney was soon afterwards apprehended in spain by king alfonso of castile and sent homeward in chains he died on the way and thus escaped punishment the fate of the guilty queen dowager remained to be settled after consideration edward the third resolved to do no more than relegate his mother to her manor of castle rising which she was never allowed to quit she was granted the ample allowance of three thousand marks and not put in strict confinement she survived nearly thirty years and only died in thirteen fifty eight thus all traces of the shameful misgovernment of the years thirteen twenty seven to thirteen thirty were swept away the heirs of the earl of kent and other victims of mortimer were restored to their honours and lands pardons were made out for all who had resisted the favourite and the officials whom he had appointed were obliged to take out fresh grants of their places a new leaf in the history of the nation was turned over and the young king began to rule as well as to reign End of chapter one chapter two of england and the hundred years war by charles william chadwick ullman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami from the fall of mortimer to the outbreak of the struggle with france the scottish war thirteen thirty to thirteen thirty seven when the sinister figures of roger mortimer and isabella of france disappeared from the scene england entered on a more honourable and fortunate period of her history everything was now in favour of the young king and it was to be many years before he forfeited the popularity which he had won by avenging his father's murder and freeing the realm from its shameful bondage edward was a handsome courteous and generous prince largely gifted with all the outward graces that win men's hearts he was an accomplished knight as distinguished in the tournament in his youth as on the battlefield in his riper years he loved splendour and display was a mighty builder a friend of music and the arts and a patron of literary men but though he did not show any of his father's weakness he was deeply tainted with the moral failings of his ancestor henry the third selfishness and a chronic incapacity to keep his promises or to pay his debts 
all through his life he disregarded the noble watchword of his grandfather edward i pactum serva abide by the plighted word and displayed an entire want of sensibility of the sanctity of private pledges or public treaties more than once he proved that he could be cruel when provoked in his later years he was destined to show signs of failing vigour long before his due time and fell into the power of favourites male and female who pandered to his failings and made him even more untrue to the kingly ideal than he had been in early life his worst fault as a practical ruler was his entire incapacity for understanding finance he loved the stir and glory of battle and could never be brought to see that war is the most expensive of luxuries that great armies must be fed and paid as well as put into the field if he had possessed a sterner soul he would have grown into a tyrant but though hot-tempered and domineering he was neither vindictive nor capable of long-planned and long-enduring schemes of oppression he was selfish and thoughtless rather than malevolent and his love of a chivalrous reputation often served him in default of a conscience england has had many worse kings and from the constitutional point of view she fared not unprosperously under him his ambition and his thriftlessness were always causing him to apply to his loving subjects for new grants of money and money was not given him till he paid for it by confirming charters and conceding privileges to his parliament in thirteen thirty however edward had not developed the baser sides of his character and his subjects were well satisfied with him during the early years of his personal rule the realm was settling down and recovering somewhat of its peace and good governance in mortimer's time disorders of all kinds had been rife ranging up to the worst forms of open murder and private war we read for example how in thirteen twenty eight sir thomas wither meeting his enemy robert lord holland in henley wood near windsor fell upon him slew him and cut off his head which he carried off on his spear in thirteen twenty nine william de la zouche tried to make valid his pretensions to some of the declare estates by raising a great band of his retainers and besieging Kerfilly, the strongest and largest castle of south wales we hear of heiresses abducted manors sacked and blackmail extorted such excesses were put down when there was once more a king who ruled and served as the fountain of justice the cessation of the scottish war allowed the much ravaged northern shires time to recover themselves commerce too began to revive though we still hear of many complaints as to the misdoing of french and flemish pirates on the high seas there were however two outstanding questions which were destined to lead to trouble at no very distant date the first was a dispute as to the homage due to the french crown for the english possessions in aquitaine the elder branch of the old royal house of france had lately died out in the male line thirteen twenty eight and philip of valois the representative of a younger stock now reigned at paris edward was through his mother descended from the elder line and seems from the first to have had some notion of refusing to acknowledge philip as the rightful tenant of the throne but he had for the time laid the idea aside and twice did homage to the new king for his duchy of aquitaine and county of ponthieu footnote ponthieu a small county at the mouth of the somme had come to edward the second through his mother eleanor of castile whose mother joanna queen of castile had been countess of ponthieu in her own right but the district had been intermittently overrun and occupied by the french End footnote. philip however was not satisfied with the terms on which homage had been done to him he proved a bad neighbour encroached on the borderlands encouraged the gascon barons to make appeals to paris and refused to surrender the county of agenois which had been seized from edward the second a few years before it seems that he had in his mind the expulsion of the english from southern france 
and was biding his time for putting his scheme into operation. For the present, nothing but small bickerings along the frontier resulted from his ill will. A dispute with Scotland was destined to lead to troubles at a much earlier date, and ultimately to involve King Edward in a war with France also. Its origin lay in one of the clauses of the shameful peace of Northampton. Robert I had promised to give back their lands to the unfortunate barons of the English party in Scotland, who had adhered to Edward II, even after Bannockburn, and had been entirely driven out of the realm. But the Bruce died in 1329, and the regents who ruled for his young son David II proved unable or unwilling to carry out this clause of the treaty. The estates had been for the most part seized by or granted out to barons of the nationalist party who had no intention of surrendering them to their previous owners, whom they regarded as traitors and enemies of their own country. Accordingly, the disinherited, as the exiles were called, found themselves excluded from the promised lands and wandered disconsolately about England. The chief of them were Gilbert Umfreville, Earl of Angus, David of Strathbogie, Earl of Athol, Walter Common, and Henry Lord Beaumont, an English baron who had married the heiress of the great earldom of Buchan. Finding themselves permanently deprived of their rights, these nobles plotted to restore themselves by force of arms and sent to France for Edward Balliol, the son of the unfortunate John Balliol who had been King of Scotland in 1292 through 1296. He, like them, had much to recover. Not only had he a plausible claim to the Scottish crown, but he regretted the broad Balliol lands and Galloway which his father had lost. Scotland was known to be divided into factions and ill-ruled by the boy king's representatives. By a bold and sudden stroke the disinherited hoped to place Balliol on the throne and win back their old baronies and earldoms. Balliol and his friends, therefore, began secretly to muster their adherents and to raise mercenary troops. Their action came to King Edward's ears, and he, very properly, refused to allow them to cross the border, and sent orders to his wardens of the marches to resist them, even by force of arms, if they should try to cross the Tweed. Turned back from the land route, the adventurers hired ships and embarked at Ravenspur on the Humba, with a little army of five hundred men-at-arms and two thousand foot. The rank and file were nearly all English-born and mainly consisted of archers. The disinherited landed at Kinghorn and Fife and marched on Perth. On their way they were met at the passage of the urn by the regent, Donald, Earl of Mar, with an army at least five times the strength of their own small force. Nevertheless, they won a surprising victory. Crossing the river by night, they attacked the Scottish camp. The regent came up against them with his host arranged in three heavy columns of pikemen, such as Wallace had led at Falkirk and Bruce at Bannockburn. The invaders ranged themselves on the hillside of Duplin Muir, with the men-at-arms dismounted in a solid clump in the centre, and the archers in a thin semicircular line on the flanks. The Scots climbed the hill and attacked the mailed men who stood beneath Balliol's banner, neglecting the bowmen as unworthy of their notice. But while they were pushing the men-at-arms uphill by force of numbers, the arrow shower beat so fiercely upon their flanks that they were finally brought to a standstill. The slaughter in the side columns was so great that they fell in upon the main column in disorder and stopped its advance. Every moment that they stood halted brought new losses from the pitiless rain of shafts, and at last the great mass broke up and rolled down the hill in rout. The disinherited mounted their horses to pursue and made a cruel slaughter of the fugitives. Among the slain were the regent, Donald of Mar, three earls and seventy knights, besides many thousands of foot soldiers. The blow inflicted by the defeat of Dublin was so heavy that Balliol had no difficulty in seizing Perth and Stirling, and getting himself crowned at Schoon as King of Scotland, while the young David Bruce fled overseas to France and took refuge with King Philip. 
Balliol at once wrote to Edward III, announcing that he had won back his realm and was prepared to hold it as a fief of the English crown as his ancestors had been wont to do. He offered as an extra inducement to secure King Edward's support to surrender the important and much disputed frontier post of Berwick. The English monarch had summoned his parliament to discuss the acceptance of these terms when news came which put a new face upon affairs. Balliol had lost his realm as quickly as he had gained it. Though a good soldier, he was not himself a man of much mark or influence, and his followers, the disinherited lords, had upset all the internal arrangements of Scotland by violently taking possession of their lost estates. The Bruce's party took advantage of the general unrest and discontent to form a conspiracy. As Balio lay at Anan, near Dumfries, with but a small guard around him, he was suddenly attacked by John, Earl of Murray, and Sir Archibald Douglas. They fell upon him at midnight, scattered or slew his retainers, and chased him to the gates of Carlisle, December 16, 1332. Immediately rising set in all over Scotland, and the new king's followers were hunted out of the country. Archibald Douglas was installed as regent for the absent David II, and his authority was everywhere recognized. Plundering parties of Scottish moss troopers soon began to cross the Cheviots and resume the raids of the days of Robert Bruce. Edward III had now to choose between David II and Balliol. He was young, enterprising, and ambitious, and much set on avenging the discomfiture he had suffered during the campaign of 1327. Accordingly, he resolved to recognize Balliol as king, to accept his homage and the cession of Berwick, and to restore him to the Scottish throne by force of arms. The recent raids into Northumberland provided him with a plausible casus belli. Accordingly, in March 1333, he gathered a great army and marched for the border. Balliol and his friends, the disinherited, joined him with their retainers, and siege was laid to Berwick. For ten weeks the strong harbour town held out, but at last food grew scarce within the walls, and the garrison offered to surrender if not relieved by the month of July, and gave hostages for the performance of their promise. Before the appointed day, a small body of troops under Sir William Keith slipped between the besiegers' lines and succeeded in entering the place, though they could do nothing to drive off the English. They brought news, however, that the regent was at hand with the whole armed force of Scotland at his back. The governor held that Keith's appearance relieved him from his obligation to open the gates, and held out when the fixed period had elapsed. The English king saw the matter otherwise, and when entrance was still refused him, cruelly hung the hostages in front of the castle gate. Some ten days later the army of succor came in sight. Douglas had brought with him a formidable army of thirty thousand men, and the English were forced to choose whether they would fight or raise the siege. Edward left part of his army in his lines to blockade the town, and took post with the rest on Halidon Hill, a rising ground three miles north of Berwick, which commands the road from Dunbar and Edinburgh. It was a good position, with a marshy bottom before it and a line of wood along its brow. The king drew up his army in three corps at the head of the slope. He himself took the centre, his brother John of Eltham the right, Edward Balliol the left. In each division the men-at-arms sent their horses away and stood on foot in a solid body in the middle, while two wings of archers stretched out on each flank of them. This was the same array that the disinherited had used at Duplin, and we cannot doubt that the English king chose it, on the advice of Balliol and his friends, the victors of the earlier fight. This order of battle proved as effective on the second occasion as on the first. The Scots were forced to attack under pain of seeing Berwick succumb in a few days, Accordingly, the regent formed his host in three heavy columns, just as Donald of Mar had done at Dublin, and launched them against the English position. They were much delayed by the marsh, but waded through it and began to ascend the opposite slope. 
but the arrow shower beat so fiercely upon them that it took them a long time to climb the hill each party that forced its way to the head of the column being shot down ere it could close only at one or two points did the scots succeed in reaching the brow and getting to hand strokes with the english men-at-arms they were repelled on each occasion for their order was lost and the main body never reached the battle-front at last they recoiled back to the marsh the english following them and making great slaughter of the fugitives the regent was slain as were also the earls of carrick menteith lennox strathern and sutherland with ten thousand of their followers this disaster came upon them because they had neglected the wise precepts of robert bruce and attacked a strong position well lined with archers to whose missiles they had nothing to oppose july nineteenth thirteen thirty three Berwick surrendered next day, and since no Scottish army was any longer in the field, Edward was able to march into the lowlands unopposed, and replaced his dependent Balliol on the throne. A permanent pacification might perhaps have followed, but for the English king's greed. He bade Balliol sign a treaty ceding to him not only Berwick, but all the border shires of Scotland as far as Edinburgh. Footnote, namely the three Lothians, Berwick, Roxburgh, Peebles, Selkirk, and Dumfries. End footnote. The Scots could not tolerate the partition of their realm, and rose again to drive out their new master. Balliol had to fly to Berwick and seek English aid once more. It was given him with an unsparing hand, and he was twice able to reconquer the whole land as far as Perth, 1334-1335. Balliol was still maintaining a precarious hold upon the Scottish crown when a new series of complications began to arise which were destined to draw English attention away from the Scottish war. Philip of France had never ceased to give trouble on the frontier of the English possessions in Aquitaine. He now began to send aid, at first with some pretense of secrecy, but soon with perfect openness to the patriotic party in Scotland. French men-at-arms crossed the North Sea to fight against Balliol, and French privateers cruised along the eastern coast of England, capturing merchant vessels and gradually making trade impossible. David Bruce dwelt at the court of Paris and sent his partisans in the north promises of continuing aid from his ally. At last rumors reached King Edward that considerable squadrons were being prepared at Calais and in the Norman ports, for an actual invasion of England. Credibility was lent to the report by piratical raids made by parties of French in Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Wight. It was obvious that if Edward continued to bestow all his attention on Scotland, he might ere long find himself attacked in the rear, 1336. Accordingly, Edward set to work to face the prospect of war with France, and began to send ambassadors to the emperor Louis of Bavaria and the princes of the Netherlands to secure alliances with them against King Philip. By the promise of great subsidies, he bought the aid of the dukes of Brabant and Gilders and the counts of Holland and Hainaut. He also negotiated a league with the Flemish cities, who were greatly discontented with their ruler, Louis, Count of Flanders, a devoted vassal and supporter of the French king. The Flemings had no wish to make war on England, with whom they transacted an immense trade, buying the fine English wool and making it into cloth, which they sold all over northern Europe. When Count Louis seized and imprisoned all the English merchants he could lay hands on, October 1336, his subjects were so enraged with him for stirring up war that they entered into correspondence with King Edward, and offered to aid him even against their own feudal lord. The lead in the rising was taken by Jacob van Atevelde, the famous brewer of Ghent, a wealthy citizen who had turned demagogue, and ruled the guilds of his native town with a despotic sway by means of his ready tongue and his strong will. The Count's power in Flanders was small compared with that of his turbulent subject emboldened by the knowledge that he would not lack allies on the continent edward began to treat the french king much as philip had been treating him for the last four years 
he gave shelter to robert count of artois a french prince of the royal house who had been driven into exile by his cousin and began to gather together a fleet in order to pay back the late piratical raids on the english coast in october thirteen thirty seven he made war inevitable by laying formal claim to the crown of france and denouncing philip as a usurper it is said that he took this step at the instigation of the flemings who told him that they had sworn allegiance to the king of france and that if he assumed the title it would of course be due to him and not to the representative of the line of valois edward's claim was a poor one he represented that his mother was sister to charles the fourth the last king of the elder line and that he therefore should have succeeded to the throne in thirteen twenty eight rather than philip who was but cousin to king charles table the french succession philip the third ruled from twelve seventy to twelve eighty five his eldest son was philip the fourth who ruled from twelve eighty five to thirteen fourteen philip the fourth's eldest son was philip the fifth who ruled from thirteen fourteen to thirteen sixteen and had a daughter joanna queen of navarre who had a son charles the bad king of navarre his second son was louis the tenth who reigned from thirteen sixteen to thirteen twenty two his third son was charles the fourth who reigned from thirteen twenty two to thirteen twenty eight his fourth child isabella married edward the second and their child was edward the third philip the third's youngest son was charles count of valois the father of philip the sixth who reigned from thirteen twenty eight to thirteen fifty his son was john who ruled from thirteen fifty to thirteen sixty four and table the french succession but there was no instance in french history of right to the crown being transmitted by a female and the peers of france had ruled that the nearest male heir should succeed there being no precedent to guide them they based their decision on a text in the salic law a code of the ancient franks which laid down that landed property should go to the male representative of the house the case had never before arisen in france for since the house of capet came to the throne in the tenth century every king had left sons behind him undoubtedly the french had the best right to decide who should reign over them and their voice had unanimously been given in favour of philip edward had practically surrendered his claim when in thirteen twenty nine he had done homage to his cousin for the duchy of aquitaine it was absurd to exhume it eight years later moreover even if it were granted that rights might pass through a female his case was a bad one for his mother's brothers had daughters whose title was better than that of their aunt on edward's principles the rightful king of france should have been charles of navarre the son of the daughter of philip v his mother's eldest brother the claim now asserted was to have the most disastrous results involving england in a lingering war whose last blow was not struck until fourteen fifty three the vain name of king of france was not surrendered even when the last scrap of territory across the channel was lost and continued to be appended to the formal title of the english kings down to the reign of george the third the commencement of the hundred years war had perhaps been rendered inevitable by philip's persistent intrigues and encroachments but it was an ill day for england when king edward formulated his claims to his cousin's crown and so embittered the strife the nation had been rapidly recovering from the effects of the reign of edward the second but it still needed peace and rest the scottish war had not much tried its resources but the bloody and expensive struggle which began in thirteen thirty seven was to prove a far more serious drain upon its resources in his reckless and thriftless management of it king edward was destined to develop all the faults of his character which had hitherto been hidden from his subjects who since halidon hill had worshipped him as the avenger of bannockburn and the best knight in christendom End of chapter two
Chapter Three of England and the Hundred Years' War by Charles William Chadwick Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The first stage of the Hundred Years' War, thirteen thirty seven to thirteen forty nine, from the outbreak of the war to the Black Death. In the autumn of thirteen thirty seven, the long bickering between england and france which had hitherto been confined to piratical incursions and unauthorized raids ended in open war the earl of derby son of henry earl of lancaster was sent over to flanders to raise the king's netherlandish allies he came ashore on the island of causant where he found the troops of the flemish count prepared to oppose him though the majority of the people of the land welcomed the advent of the invaders. Darby beat off the Count's men-at-arms with ease, for they could make no head against the English archers. They fled in all directions, leaving their leader, Guy, the Count's bastard brother, a prisoner in the Earl's hands, October 1337. Edward himself was not able to follow so soon as he had hoped, for he found himself unable easily to collect the money needed for raising a large army. Parliament granted him the means of procuring a great sum by the expedient of permitting him to buy twenty thousand sacks of wool at three pounds a sack from the wool growers, and to sell it abroad at the best profit that he could make, while other exporters of the commodity, if natives, were to be taxed forty shillings a sack, and if foreigners, sixty shillings. In addition, the barons and knights gave him a tax of a fifteenth, and the town and clergy one of a tenth on their property. These liberal votes were to prove quite insufficient for the king's thriftless hand. Edward sailed in July 1338 from Orwell with 1,600 men-at-arms and 10,000 archers, but their maintenance was only a small part of his expenses he took into his pay all the princes of the Netherlands, who were far more anxious to get the English money than to set their troops in the field. He also went to Koblenz and wasted vast sums in a magnificent conference with the emperor, Louis the Bavarian, who granted him in return for cash the empty title of Vicar General of the Empire for the parts west of the Rhine. Edward soon found that this dignity gave him no more power than he had before, and he had the greatest difficulty in inducing the Duke of Brabant and his other allies to join him with their vassals. He could not get them mustered till the spring of the following year. Meanwhile, he with his court and his army lay at Antwerp, spending much money to no profit. The king's enforced idleness seemed all the more exasperating when news came that King Philip had gathered a great fleet of Norman and Picard ships, strengthened by a squadron hired from the Genoese, and had sent them forth to ravage the south coast of England. They landed at Southampton on a Sunday when all the people were at mass, and sacked and burned the place. Next they passed on to Portsmouth and did the like with it and the neighboring villages. Then they returned to France with their plunder, quite unmolested. This expedition deserves memory for the fact that the French fleet carried the first cannon which the English had ever seen. They were little pieces described as iron pots, throwing iron bolts by the force of gunpowder, and did nothing effective. But their appearance marks the first beginnings of a new stage in the art of war. Late autumn, 1338. In the following summer, King Edward at last got his refractory allies together and marched into France with an army which is said to have amounted to nearly 100,000 men. But this great host effected nothing. They laid siege to Cambrai, but failed to take it, and then marched through the Cambrai and Vermandois, ravaging the land. King Philip came out against them with an army as large as their own, but he acted most cautiously, posting himself behind woods and marshes, where he could not easily be assailed. It was to no purpose that Edward drew up his army and offered battle more than once, 
the French would not leave their position and could not be attacked in it. At last, when his provisions were exhausted and his foreign allies began to steal home, Edward was forced to retire ingloriously into Brabant, having accomplished absolutely nothing by his mighty display of force. Meanwhile, all the parliamentary grants were spent, and the king found himself in dire poverty. He wrote urgently to ask for more money, for he was already thirty thousand pounds in debt, though he had had the handling of three hundred thousand pounds, a sum which seemed almost incredible to the men of the fourteenth century. He had even pawned the crown of state to the Archbishop of Trier for sixty thousand florins. He was forced to come home to raise more funds in the spring of 1340 and obtained the very liberal grant from Parliament of the Ninth Lamb, the Ninth Fleece, and the Ninth Sheaf for the two years next to come. But this was not conceded to him without conditions. He was made to swear to redress many grievances, such as the extortions of his sheriffs and purveyors. Moreover, he was made to promise never again to raise a tallage, that is, an arbitrary tax on the towns and manors which lay in the royal demesne. Having once more some money in his purse, Edward resolved to set out again for Flanders. But he received news, which turned out to be quite correct, that the French fleet which had ravaged the south coast in the previous year was again at sea, and intended to intercept his passage. It was necessary at all costs to gain command of the narrow seas, and all the ports of England were ordered to equip vessels and send them to the harbour of Orwell in Suffolk, from which the king was to sail. On June twenty second, 1340, nearly two hundred ships, small and great, weighed anchor for Flanders. The French were not met on the open water, but when the Flemish coast drew near it was seen that a perfect forest of masts lay in the port of Schlausch. The enemy was waiting there with a fleet about the same in number as that of King Edward. It was said there were 190 sail, but 19 of them were so great that the like of them had never before been seen. These appear to have been the Genoese vessels, which were true ships of war, and not mere armed merchantmen like the rest of the two fleets. The enemy was moored in three lines, with ship laid close to ship, and barricades built across them, so that it was impossible to force a passage between them. But Edward, by feigning to fly, induced them to cast off and pursue him. He then turned and plunged in among the hostile ships. The battle was a confused medley without any manoeuvring, for the fleets lay wedged together broadside to broadside, and most of the work was done by boarding. The English archers gradually shot down the hostile crossbowmen, who could not stand firm against them for long. Then the knights clambered from ship to ship and swept the decks of the enemy. Edward himself was in the thickest of the fight, and won the admiration of all men for his audacious courage. By the afternoon the French fleet was completely crushed, two-thirds of the ships were captured, and more than 20,000 men were drowned or slain. This great fight, the second naval victory in the English annals, put an end to any attempt of the French to dispute the dominion of the seas. For the rest of the war the English went where they would, and always made the sea their base of attack. 24th of June, 1340. But splendid as was the victory of Schlausch, it had but a negative effect on the general fortune of the war. It prevented any chance of the invasion of England by the French, but it did not give King Edward any help in prosecuting his plans for overrunning northern France at the head of his Netherlandish allies. Soon after his arrival in Flanders, he mustered them and led them to besiege Tournay, July 1340 but he found himself as wholly unable to take the place as he had been to reduce Cambrai in his last expedition. After lying before it for two months, he found that his cash was all spent and that his allies were melting away from him. Meanwhile, King Philip had appeared at the head of a large army and was watching the leaguer from a distance, 
though he utterly refused to offer any opportunity for a battle. Edward found that he could do nothing. The rains of autumn were beginning, no more money came in from England, and vexatious news had arrived that the French were winning castle after castle on the borders of Aquitaine, and that the Scots had once more driven out Edward Balliol and sent their plundering bands across the Tweed. Depressed in spirits and conscious of his helplessness, the king stooped to propose a truce to his enemy. Philip, who had secret intelligence that Tournay was suffering terribly from famine and might surrender at any moment, gladly listened to the offer, and an armistice to last for nine months and to extend to Scotland and Aquitaine was signed, September 1340. Edward promptly disbanded his army and returned to England in great wrath, blaming everyone rather than himself for the failure of his campaign. The moment that he reached London, the king gave vent to his wrath by the wholesale dismissal or arrest of his ministers, whom he unjustly accused of having wrecked his plan of campaign by embezzling or dissipating the money which Parliament had voted him. He deprived his chancellor, Robert Stratford, Bishop of Chichester, of the seals, put the treasurer, Northborough, Bishop of Lichfield, in custody, and imprisoned Stoner, the chief justice, with some of his colleagues, the chief clerk of the chancery, the mayor of London, and many more. But Archbishop Stratford, the chancellor's brother, bore the brunt of his wrath, having been practically acting as prime minister for some years. He was the person on whom Edward laid most of the blame. It was attempted to bring him to trial for maladministration, but he claimed the right to be judged only by his peers, the barons and bishops of the House of Lords. Stratford met with general support, and Edward was compelled to yield, when a committee of the Lords reported in favour of the Archbishop's contention, and laid down the doctrine that peers cannot be arrested, judged, or outlawed, save in full Parliament before their peers. The king's wrath soon burned out, and he acknowledged himself to be in the wrong by reconciling himself to Stratford, releasing his prisoners, and humbly suing Parliament for fresh supplies. These were only granted him after he had conceded three very important constitutional privileges. The first was that he should recognize the right of the peers which had just been asserted by the archbishop. The second, that his ministers should in future be appointed in Parliament and sworn to obey all the laws of the realm, and the third, that Parliament should appoint commissioners to audit all the accounts of money voted for the king's service. Thus the Lords and Commons obtained two most important methods of checking the king's rash actions. They were to have a hand in the appointing of his ministers and in the auditing of his revenues. May 1341 but Edward had the shameful duplicity to make a private protest that he did not hold himself bound by his word, and some months later openly declared that he had dissembled, as he was justified in doing, in allowing the pretended statute to be sealed for that time, for all acts done in prejudice of his royal prerogative were null and void. October 1341 for two years after this scandalous trick, Edward did not dare to call a parliament. Meanwhile, the war languished mainly for want of money, but also because the Emperor Louis and most of the other useless allies of England dropped away and made separate truces with France. On the Scottish border, things went from bad to worse. Stirling and Edinburgh fell into the hands of the Patriots in 1341 and Balliol's hold on his uneasy throne was so completely lost that he had to take up his permanent residence in England. It would now have been best to make peace with both France and Scotland and acknowledge that the war was a failure. But Edward's energies were not yet exhausted, and he was just about to be presented with a new opportunity of vexing King Philip. A bitter war of succession broke out in Brittany, the second most important fief of the French crown. Its cause had some similarity to the dispute which was already raging between Philip and Edward for the crown of France. When Duke John III died in 1341, 
the duchy was claimed both by his eldest brother's daughter jeanne countess of blois as nearest of kin and by his younger brother john of montfort as nearest heir male there was some irony in the fact that king philip whose crown had come to him as heir male of charles the fourth supported the countess of blois while edward whose french claim rested on the theory that rights could be transmitted by a female became the advocate of montfort who was urging the doctrine of the salic law footnote the breton succession arthur ruled from thirteen o five to thirteen twelve his son was john the third who ruled from thirteen twelve to thirteen forty one his second son was guy of pontievre who had a daughter jeanne who married charles count of blois this was the claimant from thirteen forty one to thirteen sixty four who was slain at Auray in thirteen sixty four the third son of arthur was john of montfort who married jeanne of nevers he was the claimant for thirteen forty one to thirteen forty five and his son john the fourth was the claimant from thirteen forty five to thirteen sixty four and the duke from thirteen sixty four to thirteen ninety nine End footnote. at first the party of the countess had the best of the civil war in brittany aided by french troops they took nantes the capital of the duchy and made prisoner john de montfort who had shut himself up within its walls but the courageous jeanne de nevers montfort's wife maintained the cause of her captive spouse and held out in the strong castle of ennebol until she was relieved by the arrival of english troops under sir walter Mani, a great mercenary captain from Eno, who was one of the most trusted officers of king edward shortly afterwards the king himself arrived with a considerable army and cleared western brittany of the french and the partisans of blois but he failed to take nantes and rennes and all the eastern parts of the duchy remained in the hands of the enemy thirteen forty two the campaign had been a success for neither party and was ended by a truce which might have turned into a peace but for the inveterate personal hostility between philip and edward january thirteen forty three it was difficult too to come to a satisfactory conclusion about the breton matter as neither claimant had got possession of the whole duchy philip contrary to his agreement kept montfort in prison till he escaped in thirteen forty five and got back to ennebel but the truce lasted for three years though border fighting never wholly ceased either in brittany or in aquitaine in thirteen forty three edward had again called a parliament which confirmed the truce and advised him to make a peace also if good terms could be obtained or if not to make open war but the unsatisfactory suspension of hostilities was all that could be gained meanwhile the national council engaged in a sharp dispute with the pope a matter in which they had for once their master's full sympathy the pope was now dwelling at avignon whither clement v had migrated in thirteen ten and was wholly under the influence and domination of the french king the main subject of grievance against him was his inordinate greed in appointing provisors to english sees and benefices he kept nominating foreigners to rich preferments whenever they fell vacant in utter disregard of the rights of the king and other patrons the clerics so named drew their revenues but seldom or never came near their cures to the great injury of the church as the english complaint ran clement the sixth appointed foreigners most of them scandalous persons who do not reside on their benefices nor know the faces of the flocks entrusted to them who do not understand their speech but neglecting the cure of souls seek as hirelings only temporal lucre the successor of the apostles was surely appointed to feed not to shear the lord's sheep the king had the full approval of the nation when in thirteen forty four he issued a mandate forbidding any person to bring papal bulls or any such documents into england except by his leave this was a reassertion of an old prohibition 
as long ago as the eleventh century william the conqueror had published a similar edict but now it needed to be once more clearly set forth it was not however till thirteen fifty two that parliament passed the statute of provisors which rendered liable to arrest and imprisonment all clerics who endeavoured to make use of papal documents contrary to the interest of the king and the realm by the end of thirteen forty five it was quite clear that no permanent peace with france could be procured and the king resolved to recommence the series of invasions which had hitherto been so fruitless this time he did not make the netherlands his base his allies in that direction had proved faithless and his chief supporter jacob van artevelde had lately been murdered in a riot though the flemish towns still continued attached to england nearly all the neighbouring states had made agreements with king philip nor was brittany chosen as the starting point of the attack edward had determined to aim at the heart of france by landing in normandy and striking at paris he sent henry of lancaster earl of derby with a small army to defend aquitaine but retained the main force for his command derby it may be mentioned proved as good a soldier in guienne as he had already shown himself at the battle of cassante and gave the enemy a sound beating at auberoche october twenty third thirteen forty five he drew down to the south a great french army under philip's son john which was still engaged in operations on the garonne when edward made his great assault on the lands around the seine on july eleventh thirteen forty six the king landed at cap Laug, with an army entirely composed of native english and therefore much smaller than the host of confederates which had taken the field in flanders in thirteen thirty eight and thirteen forty one it included about four thousand men-at-arms twelve thousand english archers six thousand welsh light troops and also a small contingent of irish the landing in normandy was quite unexpected edward had concealed his purpose and every one had thought that the army was intended to aid the earl of derby in guienne the french were wholly unprepared for an assault in this quarter and edward was able to march through normandy for many days without meeting with much opposition he ravaged the countryside and took several open towns barfleur valogne carentin st lo one after the other at Caen, he first met with a hostile force but easily routed the norman militia and took prisoner their leaders the counts of tancarville and eux the chamberlain and constable of france after plundering the rich town he struck at rouen but could not reach it for the french had broken all the bridges of the lower seine then edward turned his invasion into a hazardous adventure he sent his fleet home to england loaded with the spoils of normandy and marched on paris keeping south of the seine this was a dangerous move for the french had now begun to assemble a great force and since edward had not fortified for himself any post in normandy he had no place of refuge or friendly territory nearer than guienne or flanders on to which he could retire paris was far too strong to be taken by a sudden attack and this was so self-evident that it seems probable that the english king was merely carrying out a chivalrous adventure when he marched to beard king philip in his capital no opposition of importance was met with on the way but when the invaders drew near the southern gates of paris they heard that king philip had collected sixty thousand men or more at st denis and had even been joined by part of his son's army from guienne the leisurely pace at which edward had crossed normandy had permitted his rival to concentrate all his forces it was impossible to go on and the english had to choose between a march on bordeaux and one on flanders nor was the latter alternative easy to take for the seine had first to be crossed and all its bridges were broken it was nevertheless this choice which edward determined to make he hastily moved on the broken bridge of poissy ten miles below paris and drove off its guards by the force of his archery then the army hastily repaired the ruined arches with planks and succeeded in crossing before king philip and his host could draw up 
Edward now hurried north with all speed. The French king followed as hastily a day's march in his rear. They kept their distance till the English vanguard reached the Somme. Here Edward found all the bridges broken and the militia of Picardy drawn up to oppose him on the further side. He made three attempts to cross at various points near Amiens, but was foiled in every one. Meanwhile the pursuers were in close contact with his rear, and it seemed that he might be caught between the French army and the peat bogs of the impassable Somme. Things were looking desperate when a peasant pointed out to the king a dangerous fort named Blanche d'Ac, the lowest on the river's course below Abbeville and near the sea. Here the stream was tidal, and at low water the ford was open for four hours at a time. The body of Picard levies were waiting on the further bank, and the passage was deep, but there was no other chance of saving the army, so the king bade his men-at-arms enter the water and force their way over. Meanwhile the archers kept up a long-range fire across the stream to gall the militia on the opposite bank. After hard fighting, the English horsemen drove off the Picard, and the whole army waded after them across the Somme. King Philip came up just in time to find the tide rising and the river once more impassable. Edward had thus gained a day's start of the pursuers and had the open road to Flanders before him. He marched on as far as the village of Crecy, and then unexpectedly bade his army halt and announced his intention of offering battle. He was now in his own rightful inheritance, the county of Ponthieu, and was ready to fight and to take what fortune God should send him. The fact was that he had found an admirable position in the front of Crecy, and that even if beaten he had a safe retreat on Flanders. The host was drawn up on the hillside just east of Crecy, its right flank covered by the brook of the Mai, and by a thick forest while its left rested on the orchards of the village of Wadicourt. There was a valley in front beyond which lay the rising ground over which the French army would appear. The English were arrayed in three corps, two in the front line, the third in reserve. The southern wing was put nominally under the charge of the young Edward, Prince of Wales, a lad of sixteen, now taking his first sight of war. He was placed under the care of the earls of Warwick and Oxford, two experienced soldiers. The northern or left wing was under the earls of Northampton and Arundel. The king himself stood behind at the top of the hill with the reserve corps. In each division the men-at-arms had sent their horses to the rear and stood on foot in a solid mass, after the manner of Dublin and Halidon. The archers formed wings thrown out on each side of the central clumps of spears and leaning forward on the flanks so as to partly encircle an enemy who should charge directly at the men-at-arms. King Philip had marched from Abbeville under the impression that the English were in full flight for Flanders. Hence it was no small surprise to him to find them drawn up in line of battle on the hill by Crecy. His army was strung out over many miles of road, and the rear was only just setting out from Abbeville when the van was already almost in contact with the English. At first he came to the wise resolve to defer the battle till the next day, but the fiery barons in the front refused to halt and pushed in so close to the hostile position that fighting became inevitable. Forced by his vassal's want of discipline to attack before he had intended, Philip drew up his army as best he could. His front line was formed by six thousand crossbowmen, mainly Genoese mercenaries, who were bidden to drive back the English archers. Behind them rode a great mass of men-at-arms under the counts of Alençon and Flanders. The other contingents were gradually coming up and taking ground to the rear in successive lines. The Genoese marched up to the foot of the English slope, and began to let fly. But the moment that they started the engagement, the archers took one step forward, drew the arrows back to the ear, and shot so fast and so thick that it seemed as if it were snowing. Their aim was accurate, and their discharge five or six times as rapid as that of the clumsy crossbow 
which required to be wound up after every discharge. In a few minutes the Genoese were hopelessly routed and fled back toward their own main body. The Count of Alençon, who had no experience of the English archery, cursed them for cowards, and in his rage bade his men-at-arms ride over them and make straight for the enemy's front. This act was as mad as it was cruel. The horsemen trod down many of the wretched infantry, but were hampered by the crowd, and could only push through in small broken parties toward the English. When they came in range they soon found that they had erred in despising their enemy. The archers shot down well nigh every one who came near them. Only a very few of the French got to close quarters and charged in on the dismounted knights of the Prince of Wales and the Earl of Northampton. Alençon and Louis of Flanders were both slain. Angered but not cowed by this unfortunate opening of the battle, King Philip launched each of his corps as it reached the field against the English line. All had the same fate as the first comers. But the French noblesse was brave and obstinate, and their fruitless attacks did not cease till nightfall. Only once did a large body succeed in closing with the Prince of Wales' corps. King Edward was asked for succor, but refused to bid the reserve charge, observing that the boy must win his spurs. His action was justified, for the French were beaten off without it being necessary to engage the rear division. At dusk, the French fell into hopeless disorder and melted away from the field. Edward would not allow any pursuit, lest his little army might get broken up in the dark. Next morning the extent of the victory could be gauged. There lay dead in front of the English line at least ten thousand men, of whom no less than fifteen hundred and fifty-two were counts, barons, and knights. The most notable among the dead was John, king of Bohemia, an ally of France, who, though he was almost blind, had insisted on leading a charge at the head of the knights of his household. He and they were found all dead together in front of the Prince of Wales's standard. The Duke of Lorraine and ten counts were slain, with half the baronage of northern France. Such was the result of the rash attempt of the French chivalry to ride down the dismounted men-at-arms of King Edward, flanked by the deadly archery of the English yeomanry. So complete was the victory that Edward could now choose his own course of action without fear of being further molested. He resolved to besiege and take Calais, the great French port which faces Dover across the narrow strait. If taken, it would give England an open door into France. Moreover, the English had an old grudge against its seamen, who were noted privateers and pirates, and had often ravaged Kent and Sussex. While Edward lay before Calais, news reached him of a second victory, almost as important as that which he had himself won. King David of Scotland had taken advantage of the absence of the English host to invade the northern counties. The Scots, we are told, thought that no one was left in England save millers and mass priests, and hoped to find the border ill-guarded. They forced their way nearly as far as Durham till they were met at Neville's Cross by the militia of the northern counties, headed by the lords Percy and Neville, and by Edward Balliol, their former sovereign, who had now practically relapsed into the condition of an English baron. Here King David suffered a sanguinary defeat. Once more the archers were too much for the Scottish pikemen, and the tragedy of Halidon Hill was repeated, October 17th, 1346. David himself was taken prisoner with many of his nobles and was retained in captivity for ten years. He was not unkindly treated, but one of his companions, John, Earl of Menteith, a former partisan of Balliol who had betrayed his master and was specially obnoxious to the English, was beheaded as a traitor, a piece of illogical and unnecessary cruelty since half the Scottish nobility might have fallen under the same accusation. After Crecy, King Edward's arms were successful in all directions. The Earl of Derby, now become Earl of Lancaster by his father's death, thrust the French out of Aquitaine. Sir Thomas Dagworth, placed in command in Brittany, routed the partisans of Charles of Blois at Roche d'Arion, and in the north the siege of Calais went steadily on. 
King Philip collected an army and came up to endeavor to raise the leaguer, but with the memory of Crecy before him he dared not attack the English lines, and after his departure the place was starved out and yielded on terms, August 3rd, 1347. Footnote. The story that Edward intended to hang seven of the Burgesses who offered themselves as victims in behalf of the whole town, and that they were only spared at Queen Philippa's intercession, seems an invention. But the leaders surrendered themselves to the king's mercy, and came out barefoot and with halters round their necks as a sign that they were wholly in his hands to spare or slay, hence probably the story. Edward made them hostages, but treated them kindly. End footnote. King Edward permitted those of the burghers who would do him homage to retain their houses, but drove out the large majority who preferred to abide by their French allegiance. Their place was filled up by the immigration of several thousand English merchants and seafaring folk, and Calais became for two hundred years a thoroughly English town. On one occasion it even sent members to the Parliament at Westminster, for the future, all the inroads of the English into northern France were sent out from this invaluable open door. The town also developed into a great centre for trade with Flanders. Repeated attempts of the French to recover it by treachery or by open force all came to nothing. A short time after the fall of Calais, another of the numerous truces which interrupted the course of the Hundred Years' War was concluded, leading each party to hold what it was actually in possession of at the moment. It would probably have been short but for a great calamity which fell on both England and France in the following year. In 1347, a deadly pestilence coming from India and the Euphrates Valley, where malignant disorders are always rife, appeared at Constantinople. In the next year it swept over Italy and reached the west, by the summer of 1348, it was raging both in England and France. The Black Death, as this plague was generally named, seems to have been a kind of eruptive typhoid fever, highly contagious and breaking forth with boils upon the body. In the crowded, insanitary towns of medieval Europe, among a people utterly ignorant of the simplest laws of health, it spread like wildfire but the countryside suffered almost as much as the cities. Many districts did not recover for centuries from its effects. The whole Norse population of Greenland died off, so that the very existence of that ancient colony was forgotten. Many depopulated parishes in Sweden relapsed into the forest from which they had been hewn out. The Grand Duke of Moscow and 60,000 of his subjects were cut off. Florence lost 100,000 inhabitants in eight months. England suffered as much as other regions for a whole year, August 1348 through September 1349, she was laboring under the scourge. The coming of the winter cold brought no relief, and it was noted that rainy weather, which was abnormally prevalent that year, seemed to be particularly favorable to the spread of the plague. The king's daughter Joanna died of it on the eve of a betrothal to Don Pedro of Castile, a fortunate release for her as he was a cruel and reckless prince and actually murdered the French lady, Blanche of Bourbon, whom he wedded in her stead. Two archbishops of Canterbury fell victims to it, John de Ufford and the scholastic philosopher Thomas Bradwardine, whom men called the Doctor Profundus. The clergy, indeed, owing to their duties at the deathbed, suffered even more than other classes. Some two-thirds of the livings of the Diocese of Norwich changed hands during the twelve-month, as is shown by the bishop's register. In Yorkshire, the mortality, though somewhat lower, yet carried off more than a half of the parish priests. Grass grew in the marketplace of Bristol. London buried some 50,000 corpses in the new cemetery, of 13 acres in extent, which was consecrated on ground belonging to the hospital of St. Bartholomew in Spitalfields. The cattle strayed through the corn and found none to drive them away. Ships were driven ashore on the coast of the North Sea with all their crews lying dead on board. On the whole, 
it is probable that there was not much exaggeration in the contemporary estimate which calculated that england lost a full half of her population during the terrible thirteen months during which the black death raged all description of local records such as manor rolls and the like seem to bear out the statement the social and political results of the black death were naturally tremendous and widespread it seems to have generated selfish indifference and demoralization and its most prominent consequence was the outbreak of a crisis in the relations of the landowning and the labouring classes so large a number of the agricultural class had been swept away that the lords of the manors could not get their lands tilled for the survivors demanded wages that seemed extortionate to their employers the latter fell back on their ancient right to demand the unpaid labour of their vilain during a certain number of days in each year this practice had been dropping into disuse for many generations for the landowners had been commuting forced labour for money and so allowing their peasants to become rent-paying tenants rather than serfs the attempt to enforce this half obsolete practice led to numberless disputes many vilains absconded others formed themselves into secret leagues to resist the lord's claims it was to no purpose that parliament in the interest of the landholders passed statutes enabling the justices of the peace to fix the rate of wages in each district and providing for the punishment of the labourer who should ask or the employer who should offer more than this maximum the laws of political economy could not be evaded and selfish legislation only embittered but could not settle the dispute this unwise statute of laborers thirteen fifty two was one of the main causes of the violent seditions among the agricultural classes which were to break out thirty years later end of chapter three chapter four of england and the hundred years war by charles william chadwick Oman. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami from the black death to the peace of bretigny thirteen forty nine to thirteen sixty it was mainly owing to the frightful calamity of the black death which fell with equal severity on france and england that the war languished for the seven years which followed the appearance of the plague for the greater part of the time there was a truce between the two countries the suspension of arms negotiated in june of thirteen forty eight was periodically renewed with an occasional short interval of hostilities the armistice did not always prevent hostile encounters while it was prevailing king philip late in the year thirteen forty nine made a desperate attempt to recover calais by treachery he offered almarigo da pavia a mercenary captain who held a position of trust in the garrison a great sum twenty thousand gold crowns to admit french troops within the castle by night but the italian met craft with craft and revealed the scheme to king edward who hastily crossed from dover with nine hundred men and took personal charge of the affair part of the french were allowed to enter when the king and his men-at-arms fell upon them and after a sharp fight captured or slew the whole body december thirty first thirteen forty nine a few months after this king philip died august twenty second thirteen fifty but the succession of his son john to the french crown made no change in international politics for the new monarch would make no permanent peace with england and continued his father's policy before he had been a week on the throne there was heavy fighting in the narrow seas a great squadron of biscayan ships passed up the channel committing many depredations on english commerce king philip had interested the king of castile in his cause and had induced him to send out his kinsman charles count of la cerda at the head of his fleet whose aims were half warlike half commercial for after passing the straits it put into the flemish ports and loaded itself with merchandise as it steered homewards 
king edward put out from sandwich with some ships which he had hastily collected and fell upon it the english were outnumbered and their vessels were much smaller than those of the enemy at first it seemed that they were likely to fare ill both the king's ship and that of his son edward prince of wales were sunk by the enemies with whom they had grappled but the crews clambered up from their sinking craft and carried the spaniards by boarding after much desperate fighting the strangers made off leaving twenty-four of their vessels in the hands of the english this fight generally known by the name of espagnol sur mer took place off winchelsea on august twenty ninth thirteen fifty the period before the renewed outbreak of open war with france was not unimportant in constitutional history besides the unwise statute of laborers to which we have already alluded and the statute of provisors which resulted from the long quarrel with the pope which had opened in thirteen forty four several other important pieces of legislation belong to the years thirteen fifty to thirteen fifty five among them were the statute of the staple which provided that wool leather and fleeces tin and lead the most important english exports should only be sold in certain towns ten within the realm four in ireland and two calais and bruges without it the main object of this statute designating the staple towns was to facilitate the levying of the duties on wool which could be more easily collected if the king's officers had to keep their eyes on a small number of places only but it harmed the small trading towns for the benefit of the greater ones and put a dangerous monopoly in the hands of the merchants of the staple who were the only persons licensed to traffic in the designated places another important step was the passing of the statute of treasons which defined more accurately than of old what offences fell under the head of treason a necessary piece of work for the judges of late had been trying to extend the meaning of the word so as to get more profit from confiscations for the king the last of the series of truces which had followed the black death ran out on april first thirteen fifty five in the summer of that year the english once more invaded france hoping to have the aid not only of their old friends the montfort party in brittany but also of charles the bad king of navarre whose broad estates in normandy were conveniently placed for the receiving of english succours but the great armament which edward was to have taken to normandy was beaten back by storms and charles of navarre had to make peace with his cousin king john in order to avoid destruction a second and smaller english army had been dispatched to bordeaux under the prince of wales who had now reached his twenty-sixth year and was entrusted with independent command this force had better fortune than the king's host and after landing and being joined by the forces of gascony executed a destructive raid into languedoc the black prince made his way past toulouse burning and harrying the countryside as far as narbonne and carcassonne both of which places he plundered till he almost reached the mediterranean this foray cut deeper into france than any english invasion before or after but it had no result but plunder and served no political or strategical purpose meanwhile the king had reorganized his storm-shattered host and passed the seas to calais in the late autumn but as he was ravaging picardy news was brought him that the scots had taken berwick by surprise and entered northumberland much angered by the news edward abandoned his enterprise and returned to his own realm to chastise the northern enemy though winter had come he crossed the border and ravaged the marches and lothian as far as edinburgh with great cruelty so systematically did he set fire to all places great and small that the scots remembered his invasion as the burnt candlemas candlemas day february second having fallen into the midst of his destructive march no open opposition in the field was offered him but his foraging parties were cut off and his retreat to berwick much harassed by the lowlanders 
in the summer of thirteen fifty six the black prince who had earned the confidence of his followers by his successful raid into languedoc resolved to repeat his incursion of the previous year and started from bordeaux with an army of some thirty five hundred men-at-arms and four thousand or five thousand infantry of whom rather more than half were english the rest of the force being composed of the feudal levies of guienne this time he did not strike at southern but at central france he passed through the limousin auvergne and berry plundering far and wide till he came to the loire apparently it was his purpose to cooperate with a smaller army under his younger brother john of gaunt which had started from england on june first to land in brittany but this secondary expedition completely miscarried though it was joined by some discontented norman barons and partisans of the king of navarre edward's own march met with no check till he had marched along the loire almost as far as tours then he heard that king john with all the levies of northern and central france was coming against him and had crossed the river at blois with the intention of getting between the invaders and their base at bordeaux the prince's army was not a fifth of the strength of that of the french and was clogged with a vast wagon train loaded with plunder he did not therefore intend to fight but made the best of his way homewards the two hosts lost touch of each other for a space but suddenly met again near poitiers where their lines of march crossed each other finding himself so close to the enemy that he could not get off without sacrificing all his booty edward halted and drew up his men on the hillside by the village of maupertuis with a hedge covering his front the river Mioson to his left and a thick wood behind him he expected to be instantly attacked but king john wasted a day in reconnoitring the english position and in sending in proposals that his enemies should surrender on terms these were of course declined next day the prince thought he might succeed in slipping off to the rear without a fight and had moved his baggage and his vanguard across the Mioson when the french were seen advancing in four lines to assault the position the english hastily got back into line of battle and the fighting soon began king john remembering the effect of the english arrows at crecy on the french cavalry had made the greater part of his men-at-arms dismount and march on foot in serried columns only his vanguard chosen from the best knights in the army were bidden to keep on their horses and ride in rapidly on the english archery as a kind of forlorn hope the rest came up on foot in three lines each composed of four thousand or six thousand men headed respectively by the dauphin and the duke of orleans and the king himself the devoted squadrons in front were led by clermont and Daudrem, the two marshals of france the black prince's force was now about six thousand strong it was drawn up as his father's host had been at crecy with two corps forming a front line and a third in reserve the northern wing was headed by the earls of suffolk and salisbury the southern by the earls of warwick and oxford they had lined the hedge with their archers while the men-at-arms stood behind to support them in reserve was the prince himself and the best of his gascon vassals jean de grailly the capital de bouche when the two marshals charged up to the hedge with their mounted men almost the whole body was shot down by the bowmen before they could get to handstrokes but the dauphin's corps coming up just as the horsemen were disposed of succeeded in closing with the english and waged a fierce struggle all along the line the prince had to send forward some of his reserve before they could be beaten off the fugitives falling back in utter rout threw the line headed by the duke of orleans into disorder and instead of advancing it left the field in company with the routed van but king john himself with his last line came forward with great steadiness and his single corps was equal in numbers to the whole english army the black prince saw that a desperate effort must be made for the enemy were fresh while his own men were almost tired out instead therefore of waiting to be attacked he put his last reserve into action and bade the entire host charge downhill upon the french 
one more precaution was taken the captal de bouche was ordered to take three hundred men to describe a long circuit to the northward and to fall upon the flank and rear of the enemy when he should see the main battles fairly engaged this movement was destined to prove decisive the french king kept his men together and made head for a time against the wearied english whose archers had now used up all their arrows and were fighting hand to hand among the men-at-arms but when the captal's small corps suddenly charged in from the rear crying saint georges guienne the french thought themselves surrounded and broke and fled in panic fear the king alone obstinately stood his ground and was taken prisoner along with his youngest son prince philip poitiers was not such a bloody field as crecy though the marshal clermont and the duke of bourbon and many other lords perished but it was specially noted for the number of noble captives who fell into the hands of the english besides the king and his son fourteen counts and nineteen hundred knights had been obliged to yield themselves to mercy the prisoners indeed were so numerous that their captors preferred to dismiss many of them on parole when they had promised to ransom themselves rather than to take the responsibility of keeping guard over them nineteenth of september thirteen fifty six the capture of the king was destined to have the most important political consequences when her sovereign lay captive in london france was without a head and civil troubles broke out on every side the dauphin as regent was unable to keep up the royal authority and nearly perished himself in a seditious rising of the mob of paris who slew the marshals of normandy and champagne before his very face the mercenaries who had served king john being no longer paid their hire turned bandits and went plundering in great bands all over the countryside worst of all the oppressed peasantry driven wild by the misery of the times burst out into an anarchic revolt against all constituted authority and in many regions burnt every castle and manor and slew every man and woman of gentle blood on whom they could lay hands it was only by a desperate struggle that the noblesse finally succeeded in putting them down this bloody revolt is generally called the jacquerie from jacques bonhomme the usual nickname of the french peasant while the land was suffering from all these woes no opposition could be offered to the english who ranged at their will through the land and gained possession of many towns and castles in short the years thirteen fifty six fifty seven and fifty eight were the most miserable that france had known since the old viking invasions of the ninth century edward the third might perhaps have made further conquests if he had not consented to make a truce of two years with his prisoner king john for he wished to give him an opportunity of coming to terms and making a definitive peace john who naturally detested the restraints of captivity was eager to get free and would have subscribed to almost any conditions when a treaty was offered him ceding to england normandy anjou men poitou and all the other lands which henry the second had held in france two hundred years before he was quite ready to grant the exorbitant demand and set his seal to it but his son the dauphin charles and the states-general very properly refused their assent may thirteen fifty nine it was not worth while even in the desperate state to which france was reduced to buy back an indifferent king at the cost of so many fair provinces the english had gained no secure foothold save calais in northern france and it was preposterous to require the cession of regions where they had proved themselves unable to establish themselves to put pressure on the regent edward the third determined to launch a new invading army into france his military reputation gathered around his standard many thousands of veteran mercenaries and these added to the strong english host which he brought over to calais composed an army double or treble the size of that which had fought at crecy it was estimated by the chroniclers at one hundred thousand strong but this figure is of course a gross exaggeration in october thirteen fifty nine the king broke up from calais and marched through picardy and champagne 
wasting the land till he came to Reims. He laid siege to the town, intending, it is said, to have himself anointed in its cathedral, where the kings of France had been wont to celebrate their coronation for many centuries. But Reims held out, and Edward then made a sweep through northern Burgundy, and then turned westward toward Paris. He laid waste the suburbs of the capital, but did not sit down before it, the season and the weather being unfavorable. Next he announced his resolve to march into the fertile lands about the Loire, and there to rest his army, deferring the siege of Paris till the summer should have returned. Meanwhile the Dauphin had forbidden his followers to make any attempt to meet the English in the open, and had contented himself with holding the walled towns. But the country was suffering so frightfully that he and his counsellors resolved to make one more attempt to obtain terms from King Edward. His envoys met the invader at Bretigny near Chartres, and there was signed the famous treaty which put an end to the first stage of the Hundred Years' War, May 8, 1360. The terms which Edward now granted were more lenient than those which he had demanded in the preceding year, but they were still very heavy. He consented to give up his claim to the French throne and to recognize John as its rightful occupant, but the compensation which he received was enormous. He was to obtain almost the whole of the ancient duchy of Aquitaine, including the parts which had been lost by John and Henry III, and it was to be granted to him as a free state, not as land owing feudal homage to the French crown. The English king was already in possession of Guienne and Gascony. He now added to his portion Poitou, Ony, Saint-Ange, Angoumois, the Limousin, Perigord, Quercy, and Rouergue, besides the feudal superiority over the counts of Foix and Armagnac. Nor was this all. In the north, Pantieu, the old heritage of Eleanor of Castile, was restored to him, and the tract round Calais was enlarged so as to include the whole of the small county of Guine. Moreover, King John was to pay for his personal ransom the enormous sum of three million gold crowns, of which six hundred thousand were to be given over at once, and the rest paid up by annual installments of four hundred thousand spread over six years. The Breton succession was to be settled by equitable arbitration. Probably the French were wise in accepting the treaty. They needed peace at any price in order to save the realm from the frightful anarchy in which it was plunged. On the other hand, it is certain that Edward would have done better to moderate his claims. He only obtained, by the vast territorial sessions which he exacted, some millions of disloyal and unwilling subjects who were certain to rebel at the first opportunity. He should have been contented with the ancient English holding in Guienne, where the towns and most of the nobles were well affected to the house of Plantagenet. His hold on southern France was really weakened, rather than strengthened, by the new additions. Thus the treaty bore within itself the seeds of future trouble, but for the moment it appeared to put a splendid and successful conclusion to the long war which had been raging since 1336. For the moment, the general aspect of affairs seemed satisfactory, for the Scottish war had also been brought to a close. Edward Balliol, who had no son, had ceded his rights on the Scottish crown to the English monarch in 1356, and in the following year Edward III acknowledged his prisoner, David II, as rightful king of Scotland, and set him free on condition of his paying a ransom of 100,000 marks, which payment was to be spread over ten years, October 1357. The long-disputed town of Berwick remained in the hands of the English, but no attempt was made to insist on the cession of the eastern lowlands, which had been made by Balliol in 1333. Altogether, this treaty was a far more statesmanlike achievement than that of Bretigny. On the other hand, Scotland obtained a much-needed repose after her long troubles, and was not again engaged in open war with England for nearly thirty years. Border affrays between the moss troopers of the two countries could not be wholly prevented, but led to no serious conflict. In 
Edward, on the other hand, was freed from the danger of Scottish attacks on his rear during his subsequent wars with France. But the friendly feeling which had prevailed between the two nations in the 13th century before the invasions of Edward I could not be renewed after sixty years of almost continuous war. End of chapter 4